O oh, my dear wife, said he, you and the children of my bowels, I, your dear friend, am in myself undone by reason of a burden that lieth hard upon me. Moreover, I am for certain informed that this our city will be burned with fire from heaven, in which fearful overthrow both myself, with thee my wife, and you my sweet babes, shall miserably come to ruin, except the which yet I see not, some way of escape can be found, whereby we may be delivered. On the afternoon of February 13th, 1945, as World War II entered its final months in Europe, 244 Lancaster bombers of the Royal Air Force's Group 5 attacked the city of Dresden, dropping more than 800 tons of high explosive and incendiary bombs, all within a range of 15 minutes. A vast conflagration began to overtake the city. Three hours later, a second attack commenced, with 529 Lancasters dropping 1,800 tons of bombs over the course of 40 minutes. The result was a firestorm that devastated the center of what was once known as the Florence of the Elbe. In some portions of the city, people were pulled down the streets into the inferno, and so much oxygen was expended by the blaze that many others suffocated to death. The morning of February 14th, as survivors emerged from the wreckage to find their city in ruins, a third attack by 311 B-17s of the U.S. Army Air Force dropped an additional 771 tons of bombs on the wrecked city. Victor Klimperer, a 63-year-old Jewish academic, described what he witnessed after the bombing. We walked slowly, for I was now carrying both bags, and my limbs hurt. Above us, building after building, was a burnt-out ruin. Down here by the river, where many people were moving along or resting on the ground, Masses of the empty rectangular cases of the stick incendiary bombs stuck out of the churned up earth. Fire was still burning in many of the buildings. At times, small and no more than a bundle of clothes, the dead were scattered across our path. The skull of one had been torn away. The top of the head was a dark red bowl. Once an arm lay there with a pale, quiet, fine hand, like a model made of wax, such as one sees in a barbershop window. Some people pushed handcarts with bedding and the like, or sat on boxes and bundles. Crowds streamed unceasingly between these islands, past the corpses and smashed vehicles, up and down the Elbe, a silent, agitated procession. Few within Germany considered Dresden a likely target for Allied bombing due to its impressive cultural significance. The city's landmarks included the 18th century church of Our Lady, the Zwinger Palace built by Augustus the Strong, Elector of Saxony and King of Poland, and the Semper Gallery, which housed works by Raphael, Titian, and Rembrandt. Winston Churchill, although he came to regret the bombing of Dresden, had encouraged his heir chief marshal, Sir Arthur Harris, to bomb targets in East Germany as a display of Allied air power on the eve of the upcoming Yalta Conference, in which he, Joseph Stalin, and Franklin Roosevelt would redraw the map of post-war Europe. The RAF considered it a military target, as its railway marshalling yards were used by the Wehrmacht to dispatch men to the Eastern Front. However, the destruction wreaked was disproportionate to the city's strategic value, especially considering that the railway yards remained intact after the bombing. The real reason for the bombing's intensity may be hinted at in the RAF briefing given to the pilots just before they took off. With refugees pouring westwards and troops to be arrested, roofs are at a premium. Dresden has developed into an industrial city of first-class importance. Its multiplicity of telephones and rail facilities is of major value for controlling the defense of that part of the front now threatened by Marshal Konev's offensive. The intentions of the attack are to hit the enemy where he will feel it most behind an already partially collapsed front, and incidentally, to show the Russians when they arrive what Bomber Command can do. All told, the bombing of Dresden killed an estimated 25,000 people. So it goes.
Kurt Vonnegut Jr. was born on November 11, 1922, exactly four years after the armistice ended the First World War. He was the third and last child of Kurt Vonnegut Sr., an architect, and Edith Vonnegut, who came from a prominent family of businessmen. Indianapolis, Indiana was the heart of the conservative Midwest, where three generations of Vonnegut's had prospered after their arrival from Germany in the 19th century. His family's fortunes were shaken, however, in 1929, when the stock market crash plunged America and the rest of the world into the Great Depression. His father's architectural firm lost work as a result, and his mother became resentful, unsuccessfully trying to sell stories to magazines to supplement their dwindling income. The family was forced to downsize, and Vonnegut was unable to attend the private school his parents had picked for him. Instead, he attended public school, where the atmosphere inculcated in him a spirit of egalitarianism that he would carry on into his writings. Hospitalization for pneumonia cost Vonnegut his draft deferment as a college student, and he enlisted in the Army in 1943. On furlough for Mother's Day, he returned home to find that his mother had taken her own life the night before, overdosing on sleeping pills. So it goes. Deployed in Europe just in time for the Battle of the Bulge, Hitler's last desperate gamble in the West, Vonnegut was taken prisoner during a surprise winter attack and transported east to Dresden to work as a laborer in the city, where he thought his war was over. When the city was bombed, he survived incineration and asphyxiation by being kept, along with other POWs, in a meat locker underground, designated Number 5. When the dust settled, he and the other prisoners were placed on corpse detail, helping to bury the bodies of the dead until his guards were scared off by the approaching Soviets that April. He was repatriated to the United States in May of 1945, shortly after the end of the war in Europe. Upon his return, he married his childhood sweetheart, Jane Cox, and moved to Illinois to begin graduate work in anthropology at the University of Chicago. He reflects on his studies in the introduction to Slaughterhouse-Five. At that time, they were teaching that there was absolutely no difference between anybody. They may be teaching that still. Another thing they taught was that nobody was ridiculous or bad or disgusting. Shortly before my father died, he said to me, You know, you never wrote a story with a villain in it. I told him that was one of the things I learned in college after the war. In 1952, his first novel, Player Piano, was published, followed by The Sirens of Titan in 1959, Mother Night in 1961, Cat's Cradle in 1963, and God Bless You, Mr. Rosewater in 1965. In 1968, with the aid of a Guggenheim Fellowship, he returned to Dresden with a fellow survivor, Bernard V. O'Hare, and the two shared a cab, whose driver lost his mother in the Dresden firestorm. So it goes. Vonnegut's novel about Dresden, published in 1969, and which took him much money and anxiety and time to write, is dedicated to the German cabbie, Gerhard Muller, and to Mary O'Hare, the wife of his traveling companion, who extracted a promise from him that his novel should not make war look glamorous or heroic. The name of the novel's protagonist, Billy Pilgrim, echoes the Pilgrim Fathers of New England, and he serves as a representative of the Protestant work ethic they imparted to what would become the United States. His story can be read as a parody of old captivity and conversion narratives, popular among the Puritan settlers of North America. The most popular example of this form is John Bunyan's 1678 allegory, The Pilgrim's Progress, written while its tinker author was imprisoned in Bedfordshire County Jail for his nonconformist preaching. Bunyan had experienced a spiritual crisis in his life, doubting not only his own salvation, but whether or not the Christian scriptures were indeed sacred writ. He drew from these experiences when composing Pilgrim's Progress, which is presented as a dream of the narrator. In the dream, the protagonist Christian is an everyman who journeys from his home in the city of destruction to the celestial city atop Mount Zion. His journey begins upon reading a book, the Bible, and after being convicted of his own sin, 
he feels a terrible weight dragging him downward until the evangelist directs him to the shining light of the celestial city. The allegory is a quest in which Christian plays a heroic role by overcoming obstacles embodied by characters like the demon Apollyon, slain by Christian who wields the Sword of Spirit, a symbol of the Word of God. The intertextual connection between Slaughterhouse-Five and Pilgrim's Progress is hinted at as early as the title page arrangement, especially when the two are compared side by side. The Pilgrim's Progress from this world to that which is to come, delivered under the similitude of a dream, wherein is discovered the manner of his setting out, his dangerous journey, and safe arrival at the desired country. The title page of Slaughterhouse Five also contains an autobiographical element that likens it to Bunyan's. Slaughterhouse Five, or The Children's Crusade, A Duty Dance with Death by Kurt Vonnegut Jr a fourth-generation German-American now living in easy circumstances on Cape Cod and smoking too much, who, as an American infantry scout, or de combat, as a prisoner of war, witnessed the firebombing of Dresden, Germany, the Florence of the Elbe, a long time ago, and survived to tell the tale. This is a novel, somewhat in the telegraphic, schizophrenic manner of tales of the planet Tralfamador, where the flying saucers come from. Peace. Both Slaughterhouse-Five and Pilgrim's Progress are the result of authors reflecting upon crises in their lives. For Bunyan, it was a spiritual doubt. For Vonnegut, it was survivor's guilt. Vonnegut's novel not only parodies the quest of Bunyan's pilgrim, and implicitly the white Anglo-Saxon Protestantism that it later upheld in the New World, but also the very structure of the allegory. Throughout Pilgrim's Progress, Christian's goal remains the celestial city, while Slaughterhouse-Five's plot centers on the city of Dresden, which looked like a Sunday school picture of heaven to Billy Pilgrim. Merry Amoretti wove garlands above windows. Roguish fawns and naked nymphs peeked down at Billy from festooned cornices. Stone monkeys frisked among scrolls and seashells and bamboo. But the typological association of Dresden with heaven is undermined when the city is destroyed by the Allied bombers in an event reminiscent of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah in the Old Testament. Many of the iconic locales in Pilgrim's Progress, like the Slough of Despond, the Valley of the Shadow of Death, the Hill of Difficulty, Vanity Fair, and the River of Death, find analogs in Billy's psychological landscape as he travels through time to the Grand Canyon, where Billy was sure he was going to fall, and Carlsbad Caverns, where Billy was praying to God to get him out of there before the ceiling fell in. And the Mississippi River of humiliated Americans, captured during the Battle of the Bulge, which carries him on to Dresden. Slaughterhouse Five, like Pilgrim's Progress, is also a story of conversion. Bunyan's dream begins with the calling of a saint, who becomes cognizant of the weight of his sin, and must then begin a pilgrimage in which he will do battle with Satan and his tempters. Vonnegut's story, opening with a calling to the reader herself, begins like this. Listen, Billy Pilgrim has come unstuck in time. Billy, a preacher's valet in the army with a nonconformist background, is described in the novel as having a meek faith in a loving Jesus which most soldiers found putrid. However, the radical Protestant Christianity that drove the Pilgrim Fathers to the shores of Cape Cod and inspired the ranks of Cromwell's new model army, had become a reactionary conservatism, where wealth and power were the signs of God's grace, and poverty the sign of its removal. After the war, Billy Pilgrim falls into a kind of moral stasis, passively accepting the cultural and political assumptions of his wealthy father-in-law, a member of the John Birch Society. The bumper stickers on his car in 1967 read, Support your police department, and impeach Earl Warren. When Billy's wife Valencia crashes her car on the way to the hospital, one of her bumper stickers endorses Reagan for president. At one point, Billy is shown turning a blind eye to the issues of race that were coming to a head in the United States during the long hot summer of 1967. Billy was on his way to a Lions Club luncheon meeting. It was a hot August. 
but Billy's car was air-conditioned. He was stopped by a signal in the middle of Ilium's black ghetto. The people who lived here hated it so much that they had burned down a lot of it a month before. It was all they had, and they had wrecked it. The neighborhood reminded Billy of some of the towns he had seen in the war. The curbs and sidewalks were crushed in many places, showing where the National Guard tanks and half-tracks had been. Blood Brothers said a message written in pink paint on the side of a shattered grocery store. There was a tap on Billy's car window. A black man was out there. He wanted to talk about something. The light had changed. Billy did the simplest thing. He drove on. All this changes after Billy's plane crash in Vermont in 1968. From this point on, he begins to speak of his radical new perspective on time and fate, as well as his abduction in a flying saucer the previous year, and how he was subsequently placed in an intergalactic zoo with an actress named Montana Wildhack by a super-intelligent race of one-eyed extraterrestrials shaped like toilet plungers called Tralfamadorians. The most important thing I learned on Tralfamador, writes Billy in his second epistle to the Ilium news leader, was that when a person dies, he only appears to die. He's still very much alive in the past, so it is very silly for people to cry at his funeral. All moments, past, present, and future, always have existed, always will exist. The Tralfamadorians can look at all the different moments just the way we look at a stretch of the Rocky Mountains, for instance. They can see how permanent all those moments are, and they can look at any moment that interests them. It is just an illusion we have here on Earth that one moment follows another, like beads on a string, and that once a moment is gone, it is gone forever. When a Tralfamadorian sees a corpse, all he thinks is that the dead person is in a bad condition in that particular moment, but that same person is just fine in plenty of other moments. Now, when I myself hear that somebody is dead, I simply shrug and say what the Tralfamadorians say about dead people, which is, so it goes. Billy Pilgrim has become the prophet of a new humanist religion, based on the science fiction writings of Kilgore Trout, a recurring character in Vonnegut's novels. He was doing nothing less, he thought, than prescribing corrective lenses for earthling souls. So many of these souls were lost and wretched, Billy believed, because they could not see as well as his little green friends on Tralfamador. Billy's conversion parodies the so-called Fourth Great Awakening, a series of religious revivals that led to a boom among conservative Protestant denominations after World War II. When asked why he still goes by Billy instead of William, Pilgrim insists that it is for business reasons. People will remember a grown man who goes by Billy. However, the name is also evocative of the most famous name of the Fourth Great Awakening, Billy Graham, who described his nationwide revivals as Crusades. Billy Pilgrim preaches the gospel from outer space with the same zeal as a Christian evangelist, and even develops something of a martyr complex when he speaks of his imminent assassination by the laser gun wielding Paul Lazaro. It is time for me to be dead for a little while, and then live again. Billy's psychosis, the feeling that he is unstuck in time, serves to help him make sense not only of his experiences in the Battle of the Bulge or the Dresden bombing, but the notion of Christian pilgrimage itself. The Puritan experiment in the New World to establish John Winthrop's City Upon a Hill eventually spawned the industrial capitalism that led the United States to become a superpower in the 20th century. For Vonnegut, the Puritan exodus to a new promised land ultimately created another wilderness. And the celestial city, be it the American Oz or the German Dresden, is burned by fire from heaven. Nobody talked much as the expedition crossed the moon. There was nothing appropriate to say. One thing was clear. Absolutely everybody in the city was supposed to be dead, regardless of what they were and that anybody that moved in it represented a flaw in the design. There were to be no moon men at all. Vonnegut's novel, which was completed the day after Robert Kennedy was assassinated, proved to be prescient. The year of its publication, 1969, saw the ultimate triumph of the American technocracy as the astronauts of Apollo 11 touched down on the surface of the moon in what Buzz Aldrin called the magnificent desolation of the Sea of Tranquility. Ironically, 
Apollo 11's success was in part due to its chief architect, who had built rockets for the losing side of the war Vonnegut had fought in. But that is a story for another episode. Having undergone a severe trauma in his youth, Vonnegut, like Billy, comes to reject Christian theology. He critiques the story of Christ's passion, arguing that the real lesson to be taken is not that one shouldn't torture and murder somebody with connections, like the Son of God, but that mistreating anybody, regardless of their status, is a grave sin. Vonnegut's view of life is essentially absurdist, a cosmic slapstick where humans find themselves in a world where wars are as natural an occurrence as glaciers, and even if there were no war, there would always just be plain old death. Despite this, Vonnegut, who is referred to himself as a Christ-loving atheist, still holds to something like a Christian ethic, one not founded upon a theological basis, but necessary as a response to humanity's unique position. Vonnegut summed up his reconciliation of Christian ethics and humanist values in an address to the graduates of Agnes Scott College. Now, some of you may know that I'm a humanist, not a Christian, but I say if Jesus, as all humanists do, if what he said was good, and so much of it was absolutely beautiful, what can it matter if he was God or not? If Christ hadn't delivered the Sermon on the Mount with its message of mercy and pity, I wouldn't want to be a human being. I'd rather be a rattlesnake. Gee, but I give the world.